Hello, everyone, and welcome to Vegas Legal Magazine Podcast. I'm Mark Fierro with Vegas Legal Magazine publisher Tyler Morgan joining us. Fierro Communications Vice President Jeff Haney, thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest today has one of the most enviable jobs in the world. He owns an adventure touring company that takes bicyclists just about everywhere. Jared Fisher owns one of the coolest bike retailers in Las Vegas, Las Vegas Cyclery, but he also owns Escape Adventures, which takes clients right across the valley to Red Rock, but it also takes them to amazing destinations across North America and beyond. Jared Fisher, thanks so much for joining us. Today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. This is, I, I'm telling, the, the, first of all, the shop is amazing. I've, that's always been my second best sport. I'm a skier, a snow skier. But bicycling is just, so, it's so healthy, it's so freeing, it's such a wonderful thing. And you walk in your place and there's like $10,000 bicycles and regular bicycles and everything in between. How did you yeah. get into this business? Well, I actually worked in a bike shop when I was 16, and I said I will never own a bike shop after that. Dead giveaway. Yeah, so, and, and there you have it. Now we have a multi-million dollar bike business. <laughs> but uh, uh, our company started from a UNLV marketing project in 1992, and my wife and I had met at UNLV my senior year in uh, hotel marketing. Uh, I was asked to do a project and I chose bike touring of all things in the hospitality business because, you know, it's hospitality. You're uh, taking clients out on adventures. They've got to stay in hotels. They got to eat food. All the things that I was learning in college. Boom. There we go. So uh, it was my senior project. And as I finished it, I thought, well, actually, this could actually be a real business. Why don't I just uh, go for it? Talk to my instructor about it. He's like, yeah, you should just go for it. So my wife and I bought four used bikes and voila, turned into a business. So here you are. Yeah. And there we go. So you, now your the place that you have now is this amazing, and we're going to get to that, amazing headquarters. Where did you start out at? Because people have been in Las Vegas for a while are going to remember uh, that. So we started out in our apartment in Green Valley on a little uh, balcony in the back. <laughs> That's where we stored all of our so bikes. Like, <laughs> and everybody has to start out somewhere. And so we were still starving college students at the time. And I was mowing lawns as a side business to earn some cash to get through college. And, uh, you know, I was never born with a silver spoon in my mouth. It was always hard work. You know, you work hard the you'll benefit from it hopefully if you make good solid decisions so that's where i grew up from that that uh mindset from my parents and uh so we started in green valley and a few years later we moved into a house over by unlv so we have everything packed in that house and we got robbed there and uh so then we moved over into naked city behind the uh stratosphere so you wouldn't get robbed so we get robbed, and there we got robbed <laughs> the, the worst. Probably nonstop. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was not cool over there. So we actually, uh, we had everything locked up, and we were still in a, we were back of Larkin Plumbing, back in one of their little warehouses back there with about 25, 30 bikes, some trailers, a couple vehicles, equipment. And uh, we had everything locked up, and I didn't realize that uh, – these people would actually remove the side of the building to get in. <laughs> so they did. They took the side of the building off, you know, a hole that would fit bikes and people walking through. And so no alarm went off and we lost everything that night. That was about four years after we started. So that was 95, 96. And I basically was going to throw in the towel and just go to work at a big hotel casino. And, uh, but then something inside said, you're an entrepreneur. You can do this. You can get through it. So I went and got a personal loan for $10,000 to reignite the business, which we had worked so hard on up to that point, but we had no equipment. And from there, uh, we drove to California and found a bunch of bikes and bought them and brought all the equipment back you know, within a couple of days and we ignited our business again. And then from there, we really started to expand. I, I learned from those mistakes on what, you know, what to do, what not to do. We couldn't even afford it, uh, insurance back in the early 90s for our business. So 
we didn't have insurance on it. So anyway, that grew into a multi-state uh, North America, South America bike touring business. We we were really uh, expanding and innovating at that time before it was it caught on the adventure travel business. Those are the early days of eco travel. And so we got in at a good early time, developed some relationships with some federal agencies around the Western United States, got special use permitting in these areas before it became popular. And that became a very valuable asset to us. And we expanded. And then from there, we started meeting people around in other countries, uh, New Zealand. So we started expanding to New Zealand. Uh, we've been to Spain, France, uh, all those European, Central European countries. Uh, countries that we're currently expanding into right now, but most importantly was our uh, relationship with the Western United States. So, and along the way, we opened up some bike shops because my wife said, we have to have bike shops or we're going to have a bike touring business. And I'm like, no, no, no. Remember what happened when I told you when I was 16, I didn't ever want to <laughs> own a bike shop. And so uh, it was her idea. But I was business minded and I knew I could do it. We did it. We uh, did it right from the beginning. And we basically grew that business into Las Vegas Cycle, which most people around the valley will probably know if they're into bicycles or whatnot. Las Vegas Cycle, which is over on the 215 and Town Center uh, exit ramp next to Hotel Element with a big wind turbine spinning out front. I've seen that turbine That's ours. Year. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah. So the, the Western U.S. is such a great region for uh, adventure bicycling tours. Um, Utah, of course, is a real mecca for mountain biking. And then there's uh, Yellowstone, some of the national parks, Arizona, New Mexico, the list goes on. What, what are a few of the most popular tours with your uh, clients and customers? Well, first off, Las Vegas is really popular because we have, we're such a melting pot for conventions and meetings and so forth. And I studied that at UNLV. It was one of the areas I really studied was convention management. And so uh, I, I did some interns with the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, and I got to grow that relationship a bit in the early days with the destination management company. So I will say that Las Vegas and Red Rock Canyon right here is an absolute gold mine for this city and we should always uh, protect and respect that area because that drives a lot of tourism it doesn't have to be bike riding it could be hiking it can be jeep tours it can be just uh, uh wildlife viewing that's one of our hot spots and that's really important to our company right now and always has been over the almost 30 years now so uh, but around the western united states my wife is actually from utah originally so she said hey you got to go check out all these national parks so we did and we fell in love with them uh bryce zion capitol reef canyonlands arches national park uh, basically fell in love with those areas and developed bike touring within those areas and so we expanded our company to moab utah which is a uh, uranium boom back in World War II. We needed a lot of those, uh, those supplies for when we were expanding our army under Roosevelt. And so that town just took off and boomed. And then it died after World War II. And so we bought an old rundown gas station, turned that into a uh, uh, flourishing bike shop. And we actually bought it from a competitor of ours who was diving. And so, and we redeveloped that whole thing and, and started working with the local agencies and building trails uh, with them. And that grew that business there. So Moab, Utah is one of our central spots too, because we, we have uh, our operations are, are there for all of Utah. But we go up to Yellowstone, Tetons, uh, up to San Juan Islands. The whole western uh, region corridor, the 11 southwest states, are uh, because uh, the earlier Roosevelt, back at the turn of the century, the last turn of the century, two ago, 1899, he, uh, he saw the importance of not turning, turning America into a European style um, development, so to speak. So he started creating those national parks in the west. And because of that, we now have these incredible parks and uh, the, the, that open value of open lands and open spaces in the West United States that really has helped out, made America an icon. I mean, when you go to these national parks around the Western United States and you go into them, most of the time people aren't speaking English. 
they're speaking, you know, Cantonese, they're speaking Japanese, uh, you name it, a lot uh, of German. Portuguese, yeah. and you go there, mm-hmm. German, and you, and I asked them their little broken English that they have. I, I, I was when I was running for governor this past uh, couple years, uh, I spent a lot of time talking to people in the parks. And I asked them, why do you come here? And they don't, they don't even have to speak. They just go like this. You know, they open up their arms and they just say, this is why you have open space. We don't have that in Europe. So that's really important. And that's really kind of where I'm going at with this is, is the West United States is key. For yeah. these bike tours, what, like, what kind of skill level do you have to be a biker to do some of these tours? Uh, well, we offer tours for all levels, families, beginners, and advanced riders. And depending on the region that we go to and the trails and roads that we pick to ride, the steepness of the hills, the descents, uh, the elevations, sometimes you got 11, 12,000 foot elevations. It's harder to breathe at that, that elevation. Those will determine what works out best for certain, certain groups of people. So we try and offer beginner family level tours to most of the areas we go. And then we have a more aggressive intermediate and advanced for those who are like into, uh, you know, Ironmans and, and so forth. They really want a hard workout the whole week. And some so. of the, so some of these bike tours, uh, like you mentioned, Yellowstone, would that be like a single day bike tour? Or is that no, sort of like those, are all, th- those are all, those uh, are all five, six days. Those are multi days. Yeah. So the difference is we do daily tours in some of the regions, but most of the big national parks that we go to, they're multiple day tours. So we go out, we cook all the food for them. If it's a camping tour, you show up to camp, we set up your tents, uh, we cook you Dutch oven enchiladas, fajitas, uh, make some apple pie so in the really, Dutch oven. So you're really going out there with yeah. a big team and it, this is yeah. a lot of planning. Absolutely, we go out there and we give them a first class experience. Now there's also those who absolutely will not camp and we get it. And so that's fine. We offer uh, very uh, upper class. Just point them to the Ritz Carlton down the exactly. street. Exactly. <laughs> we'll stay. We'll stay in the high end. For the bike ride. <laughs> yeah. Gen- generally, right. So generally, we'll stay. A lot of these beautiful areas uh, have ski resorts next to them, and most of these ski resorts have really nice hotels and so forth. So we'll stay at those, and then the, we'll go back there at night. So they can do the spa. You know, eat in a nice restaurant, and then during the day we'll go out and get you know dirty and and sweaty and whatnot, and jump in the rivers, and then come back at night again. So, very cool. And we're going to give you an idea of what it is that we're talking about. We're going to run a quick video on what happens when you take a trip to the Tetons.
So, you, you know, you look at that video. First of all, everything looks so blessedly cool. It's like the opposite of Las Vegas. What time? What what times of the year are you going this year in the Tetons? Uh, in the Tetons, we'll be there in the summertime. Uh, you don't want to be there in the winter time unless you like to bury yourself in the snow and, and so forth. Well, <laughs> you 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 like to ski, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so. Right. So I like the snowboard as well. So, but uh, the tours for what we're doing, outdoor adventure, you know, they're going to run in June, July, August, September. So, so these tours, you go out and, and um, you have these trucks that are obviously built out specifically for this task. Nobody builds a truck like that off the line. What was the, what was the vision for that? Did that just come over time as an um, evolution or? Yeah, so basically each area that we go to requires uh, certain s specific equipment based on if it's going up steep roads, like in the high Sierras of California, when you have 18%, 20% grades on a road, mm. you need a specific vehicle that has lower gearing and so forth. It, if we're going on a mountain bike tour into the Maze District of Canyonlands National Park, you have to have a... a you know, uh, anti slip rear axle, you've got to have super low gearing, you've got to have 37 inch tire, tall tires, lift kit. You have to build these vehicles out specifically to where you're going to be taking these people's gear, your food, and your water for a week. And it has to get there safely and on time because otherwise you're responsible for, well, you're responsible for these people's uh, livelihood while they're out there. They want to have a good time. So we design our vehicles based on where we're going. So certain vehicles only go to certain tours. So uh, you know, the Maze District is one unique vehicle. We're the only company in the world that actually goes into this place called the Maze and the Doll's House. And it's just this crazy backcountry Jeep road that dives down into this gorgeous, place where all these beautiful red rock hoodoos are around but to get there with the amount of equipment and water and food you've got to build a specific vehicle for that so that's what we did is is is, is innovated our way in there so you know one, one of the things about uh, mountain biking is that you can get yourself into trouble really really quickly a lot of these trips look like well just drive up there and i'm good to go but i will tell you that in all of the times that i've ever had it's not getting off the trail skiing. It was when I got lost mountain biking. I, we weren't with a guide. Right. And the first time we went down the wrong hill, uh, 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 it was funny because, you know, you're just sending a thousand feet and you're, so you get to ride down. <laughs> then you get to the end, you realize it's blind. Right. And you got to come back up. And then you realize you can't do another one in the same 24 hour period. It was just too much work and nobody's coming along. There's nothing. And so it really does make a, a lot of difference. Not to mention you twist an ankle, you step off of something. You guys have yeah. all of that. Yeah, well, first thing is the safety of our clientele. And uh, so I, as, uh, as the CEO of my company, I require all my guides to be not just first aid or CPR certified because that doesn't really tell me a whole lot. Yeah, it's a weekend course, but I require them to be outdoor uh, wilderness first responders, which is the step right below being an EMT. So that's the first thing. So when we send our, our, our clients out for a week in the middle of nowhere, my guides can take care of most major or minor intermediate uh, sprains or anything that happens. Those don't happen often because we know the routes we go to. I mean, you can, yeah, sure, you can pull up an app on your phone and look at some trails that descend down a certain area, but that doesn't tell you a whole lot. It doesn't tell you about the rocks that might be in the trail or some stream crossings. It doesn't tell you if there's other trails that go off of it. That's why a guide service will take you through these areas safely and, you know, in an interpretive service where they explain the region that you're in and and uh, the, the the surrounding area around you and the importance of the wildlife or the the geology those types of things I and mean, that's why you hide a uh, hire a guide guide services for those reasons for the safety for the the information that you'll learn on the trips and it's hassle free yeah. you know worry free so you see a lot of smiling people on your trips there are, there are people in their late 60s early 70s off on these bikes and at the end of the day everybody's just grinning ear to ear yeah well currently um the market in america is almost at 20 percent of electric motor bikes so they now have these their pedal assist bikes 
And what that is, is, is for every watt of output you put in your crank, it doubles it for you. Oh, wow. So this has really opened up the doors to people who are getting older, who love to cycle, want to be outside, but their body may tell them, hey, you know, you know, you're 80 years old now, you can't go. Well, these bikes are now letting these people go out on tours, which is awesome. So they get out in these backcountry areas, see the scenery, don't have to work as hard. But, you know, at the end of the day, if they want to turn their, their uh, battery off on these bikes, well, then they can do that and get the heck of a workout that they want. Well. So it's something new that's really up and coming in the states. Now, I can say that our policies uh, are not uh, moving as fast as the bicycle technology. So some of the areas we do tours does not allow these, they're called e-bikes, does not allow these e-bikes quite yet. The national park system has not caught up with that yet. So we're not allowed to go into certain national parks. Uh, some of the national forests uh, based on the district rangers are allowing it. So we do have permits in some of these areas right now for some of these new tours in Moab and uh, the Zion Bryce area that we can now run these tours with these e-bikes. So a lot of people who are, uh, are getting older, they have those smiles on their faces because they're, they're, they're feeling like, hey, this is what I was doing when I was 20. Yeah. I'm pulling it off yeah. and this is why it's happening. And it also helps out for some kids too who may not have the ability to get up a hill you know, they may need a little extra boost. So what is it with the e-bikes that they don't allow them in some of the parks? Well, what's happened is because there's a motor, the, the laws in the national parks do not allow motorized travel off road or on trails or on certain paths. And so it's the way the law was written. And as we know, you know, technology and and things change, innovation changes over time, and we need to make sure we keep up with those changes in our policy making. So it that's takes something... a while to get through the bureaucracy as far as yeah. how they're going to classify think, it. As yeah, I mean, I, I essentially, I don't see any problem with an e-bike on uh, trails and roads. And, uh, you know, there, there's things you need to address, but, uh, at the, you know, for the most part, you're still pedaling. You know, it's just a bike. It's just a little extra boost. It's, it's like a little having, assist, so you don't have to worry about falling behind the pack. And, right, uh, you can stick, stay with them. You know, and it keeps. In my opinion, I think it's a great way to keep uh, keep families and couples together because you've got uh, a woman who's a iron an iron athlete, and then her husband who's you know goes to work every day and you know has the danishes and the coffee and doesn't ever work out and she wants to go on a, a vacation somewhere and she can't do it because she can't take her husband the lump now <laughs> she can take her husband now it works the other way too some of you some of you got the you know the husband and he wants to take his wife and so it, it, it can kind of work it, 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 it basically uh welds those relationships Together. to the point where they can both go out and have an adventure vacation. Well, it's definitely a, one of those uh, barriers to entry where you just can't consider something and then you go, well, I can do that. That I can do. <laughs> um, you know, you look at these um, incredible athletes and these, you know, they're just top of the heap athletes and Jared is out there with them. The difference is He's videoing them. He's riding along with one hand with a gimbal, riding this bicycle, <laughs> and, and the video that you do, Jared is a client of ours, point of disclosure, um, and you do some really great gimbal work and some really just beautiful drone stuff that you, know, you just wouldn't get a chance to see if, you, if you're not out on a bike. You can't get there with a car. It, yeah. It's not accessible any other way. Yeah. Just some beautiful work. Did, but did you ever think you'd be able to bring a camera along like well, that? Well, I never stills? thought of myself as a videographer or a camera guy. I was never into it. it. It came out of necessity. And I realized that in order for people to be able to see what we're experiencing out there, they're going to have to get there. And I couldn't convince anybody to go to these places, you know, 15 miles on a backcountry trail with 3,200 feet of climbing that takes three and a half hours to get to, I couldn't, you, you can't find anybody to get there, especially throwing a drone on their back. Yeah. And I realized, well, 
looks like I'm going to be doing it. <laughs> and so that's how I got into it. I just started doing it on my own and I figured out how to fly. You know, I've crashed a, I've crashed a half a, crashed a half a dozen drones, <laughs> spent uh, over $10,000 and destroyed drones, but figured out how to do it, how to fly, how, to, you know, the times of day to shoot. So I just kind of figured it out on my own. And, and that's how I've gotten those shots that you see. Just amazing. Amazing. Just so, beautiful photography. So there, there must be a particular trail or journey that really holds a special place in your own heart for for whatever reason. Uh, one particular trail that's real uh, real meaningful to you above the others. Do, do you have a number one personal favorite uh, trail? I have a lot of number ones, but I will answer that question. There is, is one specific trail that really does stand out for me, and that's called the Rainbow Rim Trail on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, when the early days when we started our company, we were an innovator in that area and there was uh, no trails up there. We were just riding on these dirt roads and over time, we started working with the Kaibab National Forest on the North Rim and, uh, you know, eventually we got this 18 mile single track right on the rim of the Grand Canyon at 8,000 feet. So in the summertime, cool temperatures, you're looking down 5,000 feet and you're in the backcountry. And it's not like the South Rim where there's people in a McDonald's and whatnot. Mm -hmm. None of that. It's just condors flying overhead, believe it or not, condors, and uh, wildlife running around, and then you and your bike and whoever's with you out on that tour. It's the most amazing experience. And so for the past 25 plus years, that's really kind of grown with me in our company. It's, it's one of the bread and butter tours for our company as well. It's only four hours from Las Vegas. but. That is a, an experience that I cherish, and I've always taken my family out there off season or outside of a tour just to let them see it. And so, you know, I love a lot of areas. I love New Mexico and Wyoming and beautiful areas, but for some reason, that's the place I just kind of like to go and just look into the canyon and watch the sunset for four hours. It's pretty cool. It is uh, one of the things you take a vacation and mentally you're rested, mentally you're rested. But unless you're out there moving your body, there's an anxiety that comes from standing still. You know, we just we sit at office all day and then we go on vacation and then we don't have to work there either. These are vacations that really kind of cleanse the mind, the body, everything. It's it is yeah. it's intense. It's a cleansing experience. Absolutely. And that's something we thought a lot about when we started the company was, you know, we can't just do like an extreme vacation out of the gate. You know, we need to take the thoughts into the fact that people are coming from nine to five job five days a week weekends mowing the lawn, getting the house in order and maybe getting out on a Sunday morning for mm -hmm. a two hour run. And how are we going to get them for five days on the North Rim of the Grand Canyon on a bike? And so we molded our tours knowing that that's our clientele and how are we going to do that? And that's what we do as a outfitters. We figure out how many miles to go, how much time, when we should have lunch, where we should have lunch, uh, how many guides to put on the trip. Those are things that you do as an outfitter, and that's why you choose an outfitter over just trying to do this on your own. When you do it on your own, it's always a catastrophe in a yard sale. <laughs> so, and, and how many that's people are typically that. on a on, on a, a trip? A, on a trip, yeah. Yeah. So, it, let's just use the Grand Canyon as an example, since we're talking. Usually, there's about six to ten, maybe twelve clients on the tour. And, and of those two people, guides. would you say it's a, I don't know an intermediate trip? Would you be able to combine sort of some more advanced cyclists with the intermediate ones so that the advanced ones aren't feeling like they're getting held back by the yeah. you know less skilled bikers? They can yeah. still get sort of their, their exercise or right. whatever and their thrill out of the day. Yeah, so generally what we try and do is we try and do a morning ride together as a group at a slower pace. And then we kind of get to camp really early in the afternoon, sometime around 1.30 or 2.00. And then from there, we have options for the more advanced riders to go out and do some other trail on their own or with another guide and just, you know, rip it up, so to speak. So that's kind of how we mold our tours in that in that basic uh, form. So you briefly mentioned some of the meals a little bit earlier, but what is the uh, food and drink situation on some of these extended tours as far as uh, types of drinks, snacks, uh, the meal schedule and, and how does that work and how do you plan all that out? 
Well, let's let's use a uh, camping tour to start with. We always have energy snacks and drinks in our vehicle, and then we uh, give those out in the morning for people to take with them in a, in a pack or a little backpack. And then, then we schedule out the times for the meals based on the group. Like if they're kind of a core group that wants to just ride more, then we'll have a little bit later lunch. You know, it just depends on the group. But we do the three meals a day. And in the format I was just explaining to you, basically get to camp early. But we design them. We, first off, anybody who signs up for tours, we ask them their dietary restrictions, what they would like to eat, because that's important. And, uh, you know, what they don't like to eat, because that's important. And so we buy based on what we have as a group. So no one tour is exactly the same. Now, we have signature dishes which is grilled salmon and portobello mushrooms. That's usually a, a staple in our tour menu. But uh, always fresh foods. We're a very green company, so we do lots of organic foods, um, which kind of support the local growers. We always try and buy from the areas, like, for example, Taos, New Mexico, we try and buy locally there. Uh, you know, not just at the grocery store, but I'll, I'll have my guides buy from a local farmer's market first and buy those fresh vegetables that were grown just down the street because uh -huh. that's kind of cool sure. and it's healthy and it tastes better. So You know, you mentioned uh, green energy. Uh, that's how I actually uh, first came across your company was the commitment to green energy when nobody knew what lead was. We, you're talking about a potato or what is it? And uh, you were among the very first to make a real commitment and really throw an investment at it. What, what made you make that decision? Well, the first thing is when you're in outdoor adventure and you spend a lot of your time <clears throat> in the outdoors and, and these backcountry areas, and then you watch them catch on fire, and then you know you talk to the, the land managers and, and they're closing down the forests and so forth. You see these changes environmentally, you start to ask questions. And so that's kind of how we, we've been watching climate change. And it's not a political issue. It's just climate's changing. Really? It's hard to ignore the polar yeah. ice caps melting. And so things like that, as, as the climate changes and our weather patterns are changing, um, I realize that, you know, we need to be uh, conscious about what we're doing as a business because that makes a big impact. And not only that, but when you're a leader in an industry, you're also setting an example for other businesses. And so I saw that aspect in what I needed to do with my company. So uh, when we started building uh, actual brick and mortar facilities to house our retail operations and our and our um, our tour operations. Um, I knew at one point we would get there, and we did about uh, uh, it was seven six six years ago now. Uh, well, we've done projects before that, but the big one was six years ago, which is the building over on two fifteen and Town Center. Uh, I wanted to make it net zero energy and a lead platinum. And so people who understand uh, the types of ways you can build buildings, uh, LEED is Leadership in Environmental Energy Development, something like that. I'm not sure the exact terminology on it. It is the gold standard. It, it's it the, gold the gold for standard for green buildings, yeah. So you buy local product, uh, um, building materials. And the other thing was, uh, so we built at LEED Platinum, which is is the top of the, the highest you can go. It's very hard, hard to attain, but I knew that was my goal and I went for it and we, we got it. And then I wanted to be net zero energy, which means we produce all of our own energy to run our company. So that is a 53 kilowatt, which is a good size solar array on top of our facility, as well as a wind turbine. And so, not only do I do it at this facility, I've done it in my Moab operations, another facility here in Las Vegas, and we're working on another facility up in Reno. So uh, there's, there's, you know, things I didn't foresee. It was a great investment. You know, I did it for, I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted to set a good example. And uh, I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, it, it, it was profitable and at the end of the day, and so it required an upfront investment of, for example, the building we're in is a quarter million dollar investment on top of uh, the, the, the cost of our building. But at the end of the day, we appraised for $100,000 more when we opened our doors after we constructed it. So that went down to $150,000 investment or output instead of 250,000. So, and then, you know, we don't have a power bill. So we're saving thousands of dollars 
every month for the past six years without having a power bill. And that's really helped us out a lot. But the one thing I didn't foresee, which is the most interesting part about it, was when we opened our doors, I started seeing a different clientele come in. And they weren't all buying bikes, but they were buying electric bikes. And I just was interested. I'm like, where are you from? He's like, oh, I'm from New Jersey. I'm like, why are, you, why are you here on business? He goes, no, I heard about your building, and I wanted to come see it. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, I saw it in uh, the U.S. Green Building Green Council uh, issue of that, or I saw it on the Department of Energy uh, website, and I saw it was one of these lead platinum net zero buildings. I've always wanted to see one. And so we started bringing in clientele that we had no idea. And so at the end of the day, you know, being in a big retail store, they're looking around and they realized, hey, you guys sell electric bikes. I could do that. And so we started selling electric bikes to clients that were never going to be in there to start with mm -hmm. until we built a green lead platinum net zero energy building. So that was an, that's a great investment and, and something we didn't see. And so, you know, I would just say to anybody else out there who wants to do something unique and different, spend a little extra money and, and do something like that, you'll find that it's very beneficial, so. You know, one of the things that um, has happened since the push for LEED and when LEED really came up with some verifiable standards and really took the position, the, the gold standard in the United States, one of the things is the emphasis on water. And um, the, when, when you ask somebody of all the things that you buy, what will pollute the most, they'll always say their car. And they're dead wrong by about a factor of 30 because you build a house wrong, you position it wrong, you build a, an office building, you position it wrong, it just sucks up electricity. And electricity in 2018, unfortunately, comes from taking water and superheating it to steam and putting it up and it never returns we it returns somewhere in the atmosphere in the form of heat and so you're you're taking the one thing that could stop stop all development stop all job creation water you know as soon as that as soon as they say no more hookups for new houses well, what happens to las vegas but when you go green when you take when you take solar when you take wind power they don't use any water whatsoever and the savings over the years is just astronomical it's so beneficial for all of us it changes yeah. everything yeah and i think the thing is about uh energy you know is uh, this running for office uh this this past couple of years i i realized that you know some people take it as a, a, a are creating it into a political issue and it it's not a political it issue be. at all it can't be it, it doesn't make any sense and you know, people ask me, you know, I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told to put solar on my house. Well, no one's telling you to do it. I'm letting you know the benefits of doing it, and you know, you're going to save money. The cost has dropped from, uh, I believe it was about uh, ten. Was it ten dollars per watt? It stopped, dropped down to about three dollars and fifty cents a watt now over the past ten years. So when I did my first project over 10 years ago, that's what I paid, and I'm still paying back on that. But I'll tell you what, the new project I'm looking at, I would be stupid, absolutely stupid, not to do solar and wind. That, that, that's gonna be one of my biggest, best investments. And let's face it, energy comes from the sun, doesn't matter whether it's oil, you know, we got dead dinosaurs, oil, that was created from the sun, you know, and decomposed plants created from the sun. This is all energy from the sun. We're just using current energy from the sun, solar, before you have to wait millions, you know, millions and millions, 60 million years for it to decompose. We're just going to use it right now on the spot, and it's clean energy, and everybody wins. So it really is an amazing development that, that, um, and, and I love the story of Tesla, that in all the world of all of these developments, uh, there are all, all of these advances taking place all around us. And every now and then the United States scores one here, scores one there, but at the top of the heap, the top of the top of the heap, energy and transportation, and the, the fact that Elon Musk looks at, looks at this, uh, developing this car because there is no transmission. And there is only one moving part in the engine. And there, right. it, you could never do that if it was an internal combustion, but he knew he saw that opening. And then by 
the idea of, of, of using lithium uh, deposits to, to build these batteries so that you could store energy, the cost of storage of energy over time, and now not having to deal in any way, a large number of Americans not having to deal in any way with any of the folks in the, in the Mideast, some of us, some of them are our friends, some of them will always be our mortal enemies. We withdraw from that. And the bottom line is the overwhelming majority of jobs that go into these electric cars it's all American. It's yeah. all American technology. Yes. It's beautiful. It's top of the line. It's the best of the best of the best. And I think you had a hand in that when you when you put money into solar power. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, you know, if we can be creating our own energy here in America, that's what we need to be doing. And let's face it, we're not going to be able to get off of oil right now. We're going to need to still develop um, our oil reserves, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to continue to buy from our enemies in the Middle East. And, you know, we do that every time that we, you know, buy uh, a, a gallon of gas, we're, we're supporting the Middle East when we're not developing in America. And we really need an all of the above plan for America, which does require oil and gas, but we can use those sparingly when we need those and we can wean ourselves off them. Let's let's face it. They're going to go away eventually. There's only so much in the world. Mm. I would rather uh, us here develop our own energy, not support terrorism in the Middle East, and have clean energy right here at home. India, China, and Germany, they're all making these billion, billion dollar bets on clean energy. And if America doesn't get on board and really push for this, we're going to lose out. We're going to we're going to be a, you know we're not going to be the leaders in the world in 20 years anymore. We're going to be falling behind China, and you know was, we've got a lot of a lot of cleaning up to do around America. But it, it takes, I think it you know I'm not not praising my my company, but it, it does take people in business who can show that helping to uh, support uh, environmentally responsible. Um, uh, decisions and so forth, pu putting those in play and also making a profit at the same time, that's what's going to work in America. And I think that's what we're doing at our company. We figured out how to do it. We're doing it now. And hopefully it'll catch on as the years go on and hopefully sooner. But, you know, it's it's been it, we've been doing really well with it. So, you know, we've got Tesla up north. I know they're going to be laying some people off, but I don't know. They'll, you know, exactly get into that too many details. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, that development, people are looking for people are asking and wanting clean energy now because they figured they figured out a long, you know, a while ago, hey, look, this is clean energy. It's not polluting. It's not contributing to the CO2 and the atmosphere, uh, you know, not producing these gases that add to the hot days, <laughs> the, mold, the excessive hot days we have in the world, and, and especially in the Southwest where water's scarce and is evaporating and moving into other regions. There's no such thing as uh, water, you know, we're not losing any water on the planet. It's just moving to different regions. Yeah, we don't want that in the part. Southwest. We want water in Las Vegas. We want water in Reno. We want to keep, make sure, and if we can be doing something that's environmentally responsible, and making money for businesses and helping our economy grow, let's do it. You know, people forget um, it, it was uh, Ronald Reagan when the when it became clear, and there there was a debate, but it wasn't a cut your own throat debate to get to the bottom of it. But people were concerned about the ozone layer, and Reagan stepped forward, and I, I don't know how how thrilled he was about it, but he did in fact end the end the use of certain refrigerants. And everybody said, well, you know, it'll be 100 years from now before the ozone layer is repaired. Well, it took a few months. Right. It happened overnight. Right. And with America, that's the thing about America. All of America's great answers, all of our breakthroughs have always been technological. They've always been thought. They've always been creativity. And that's where we, that's where we end up leading the world. And I, and I think we're going to end up leading this one. So... You brought up the fact that you did run for office. How did that go, and would you do it again? Well, will it's, you do it it's again? not surprising that I didn't uh, win the primaries, but it, it was a little disappointing because, you know, you always think, oh, you know, darn it. <laughs> I didn't Could break through. through. But, of course, it was my first time running, and uh, a lot of people ask me, why would you run for governor right out of the gate? 
and I just didn't see myself doing anything else right away and I needed to uh, you know go where I thought because in my company you know uh, I'm a leader in my company and I'm in an executive uh, level and so I looked at the executive level positions for our state and and governor which was uh, definitely an executive level position uh, was right up my alley I, I looked in all the prerequisites and 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 whatnot and it turns out you got to have a big name too and so I didn't have that and that's okay because we built our name up during the primaries so I'll be back out there eventually I'm gonna take a little while off and, and grow up in northern Nevada with uh, my company and hopefully we'll spread some some good uh, synergy up in that area and that'll grow the name and so out of you know in the future I'm, it's not, I'm not out of politics I'm definitely concerned about Nevada this is my home my family has been raised and born here and uh, I want to see Nevada be the leader in lots of areas around not just the country but at the world and you know as Clinton said you know we are the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy we are and that. so you know he was really right there oh. and as if we can we can kind of surpass some of these political roadblocks that don't need to be there you know I'm a Republican but at the same time I understand the importance of environment and green energy and producing our own energy in America. So anyway, so, you know, the politics are, I'm definitely, I, 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 you know, I used to not like politics and I realized, well, actually I'm interested in politics after all, because these are important. We, we need people making good, solid, sound decisions who, who have their, you know, their hand on the heartbeat of this state. And I rode around the state on my bike three times. So met with everybody in every community that I could find. And, uh, and I've been running my company here for going up close to 30 years now. So I've got a good feel for the state and know what's going on. I just need to, uh, you know, see some a little bit more of the cobwebs in the political world before I get to where I need to be in the future. So, and I think you come from the right perspective and that's the perspective of entrepreneur. People always talk about how many jobs are created under this administration or that administration, but they forget that the bulk of those jobs, they're not created by government and they're not created by big giant companies. They're created by little companies like you and I that go out there and roll the dice and just hope that things you do all the planning you can, but it is what it is. What would you say to somebody that's thinking about going into into a, an entrepreneurial um, a business where you really, really have to take a chance the way you and your wife did? And um, would you say that there's still room for success as America? Is this the time to throw the dice on? on well, I will say that the, you know, the economy is uh, psychology. <laughs> so you've got a business uh, owner in the presidency of the United States. So psychologically, people see that and they feel comfortable about business. So I think that's part of the reason America is actually booming right now for that reason. But let's kind of hone it in on Nevada. Uh, I just, we need to make sure we keep at the avenues open and we keep the environment business friendly, which means we don't want to have too many regulations and, and roadblocks for people who want to start a business. They need to be able to look at what they need to do and, and have a government that is willing to help them and who is friendly about it. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I foresee for Nevada's future is clearly making that business friendly so that somebody who wants to open up a donut shop doesn't have to, you know, wait six months for uh, permits and, and particular uh, uh, whatever the things they just, just kind of get in the way just roadblocks yeah, yeah no, I've never opened a donut shop before I did work at Dunkin Donuts when I was <laughs> 16 right before my bike shop uh, ordeal but at the but we need to make sure you know the the, the that we create an environment and that's the key thing and and making sure that uh, you know we have an economy that's 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 able to absorb that too we need to make sure that we have water here because you know it's psychological you know people see southern nevada as lake mead goes down they may not be as apt to to move here and start a business but uh so we need to think about things like that long-term goals as well you know you can't just look at the short term short-term goals you need to look 15 20 years in the future so uh 
Did you make yeah. it through every single county in the state on your yes. uh, bike ride? Oh, yeah. There's, there's, there's not many people who can say that, especially on a, on a bike, let alone yeah. uh, any other form of transportation. Well, and I, certainly, no, certainly not many people in politics. <laughs> no, I thought it would be unique, and I love bike is, riding, so. and I was ready for a two-week ride. So each time I went out, uh, I went out for at least a week across the state. So I went through south of Highway 50. I went around the whole state, basically, on a 1,300-mile ride. And then I did another one, uh, internal loop, 500 miles. So I hit literally every town except for Jackpot. <laughs> That's <laughs> one town because it was kind of up but a little bit out of the yeah. way. Now, I've been to Jackpot, but not on my it's bike. It's on the Idaho border. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So, But I got to ride through these communities, and it's different when, you know, Two I was big thought, loops will do it. That'll take you just about everywhere there is. Yeah, the, I the, rode 2,500 miles on my bike through, wow. the, through yeah. the state just on my campaign. I've ridden mm. tens of thousands of miles through Nevada mm. on, on other rides. But I've always told people, you know what? If, if, if we're going to have people making decisions for our state, they better know every county. They better know what the people are thinking, what the farmers are thinking, you know, how how are they dealing with energy in their counties? There's a lot of things going on around the state that are really important to, uh, for one person that may not be important for people in Las Vegas. And so understanding, uh, getting your, your hand back on the heartbeat of these different people in these counties and what they care about and the economic development within these counties, understanding, you know, in Alamo, they have different ideas of how they want to grow their their town as opposed to, say, Winnemucca, you know, and they have different features to the land and they have mining Yeah, it's uh, ranching versus mining versus traditional yeah. small business. Yes. And they, they all have to work together in, exactly. in, within the state. Exactly. And you can't take away the mining in Elko. It's really important. Right. And that's important to those people in those, in those areas. It provides a lot of jobs for those people. So, you know, you can drive to these places and talk to people, but when you see a farm for three hours as you're riding to it, and you get a feel for the National Park, Great Basin over to the right, and some of these uh, these drainages that Las Vegas wants to, you know, take for Southern Nevada coming down from Great Basin and, and then talking to these farmers who are running these farms in Central Nevada who have nothing to do with farms. We're only running these farms up there because we want the water rights because it has to you have to be working the land. Yeah. But understanding those things, talking to those people, you start to understand um, you know, what their needs are. And I think that is really important for anybody who's going to be sitting in an executive role for the state. So that's why I did it. It's it, it is a great story, and um, I, I I think you your your dedication to green energy alone I think uh, earns you a place at the at the table when it comes to both entrepreneurial and uh, and the political end. I, I, I think it was a, okay. and not only that it's so high profile right on the two fifteen. You've got this giant. Have you seen that white spiraling thing? That's that's Jared Shaw. So we play this we play this game, and it okay. is so best place to live in Las Vegas. Well, I actually don't live in Las Vegas. <laughs> there you go. There's a new I, one. <laughs> I, live, <laughs> I live in Blue Diamond, the little dinky rinky town with 250 people. Which in is Red the Rock. Bike, bike riders' paradise. But it's Las Vegas. <clears throat> so uh, that's the best place to live in Las Vegas. I've lived there for almost 20 years. I've uh, delivered two of my kids upstairs in my house. <laughs> so that I think it's awesome. But uh, I... You know, I like Southwest Las Vegas. I think it's awesome. But at the same time, North Las Vegas has always caught my eye because you think of, uh, you know, the old Las Vegas, but, uh, you know, John Lee, the mayor up there has done, you know, really good job of growing the industry up there, which Big is really turnaround. cool. So, so I kind of, I, I, it's a toss up. I love Southern Nevada. I love Nevada in general, but. I live in Blue Diamond, so it's my favorite place. Blue Would Diamond's you, a great answer because it's so unique. We it haven't, is. Uh, haven't standalone before, community. Yeah. When John Lee first got to office, I said, so, Mayor, what, what is the big industry? And he said, I'm not sure, but I think it's like Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, yeah, no, it's well, like, you know, there that, was nothing going on. It was that's just funny. It was just retail stores, not all of them in real good shape. <laughs> and now every time you turn around, there's a new business yeah. that's thinking about going up to Apex or somewhere in yeah. the surrounding area. Your question. Go. So what is your favorite restaurant in downtown Las Vegas? Whoa, man, I'll tell you. Uh, I... <laughs> 
I just like going to buffets. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it matter. Like downtown Las calories. Vegas. <laughs> downtown Las Vegas. Actually, my company runs the RTC Bike Center as well in the Bonneville Transit Center. So I'm down there a lot now. Yeah. And I've uh, uh, watched the town change down there and all these new restaurants come up and, and – downtown Fremont Street area. I think they're doing a fantastic job Big down turnaround. there. Big turnaround. Huge turnaround of uh, what Zappos has done down there. And so there's some great restaurants. I don't really know them all. I just go to the buffet. Say Bocho, Bocho. The buffet the, downtown <laughs> would have to be uh, Main Street Station. I think yeah, that's the one I go to. That yeah. one and whatever. I don't remember the other I casinos. <laughs> so how about um, what's your favorite show in Las Vegas? My favorite show, okay, well, I, I know this is going to sound really weird, but I really like Donnie and Marie. <laughs> I think they're awesome. I got to tell you something. I have a lot of friends who are in and around video, and they work with very famous people. They work with celebrities all the time. And I haven't heard as much about Marie, but what I've heard over and over and over and over again about Donnie Osmond is that he's the nicest guy that ever came to Las Vegas. Just the most genuine person cares about every single person in the room and that's when no one's watching he is awesome we my wife and i for her birthday uh so my family has a band as well we just produced our very first album and my wife wanted to hand deliver a copy of our cd to donnie and marie huh. and so i bought the 150 dollar after the show you know <laughs> meet donnie and he was so genuine, so nice, and we got to hand him that CD. And I don't know if he ever listened to it, but but he, I was just really impressed at at at, at just who a great person he was. So well, my was, friends in video aren't impressed by anybody, but they were truly impressed with him. And I'm not knocking his sister. I'm just saying that he stood out in their minds as one of the greatest guys ever. Yeah. Um, so anybody you admire in politics? Well, in politics, that's a tough one because I I'm uh, I'm newer into politics that I would say, but I, you know, I I take I say I like to I'm I'm kind of one of those guys who listens to the best parts of what people have to say, and I try to mold that in and work together with people. So, sure, there's dirty politicians that are out there who've done some really bad things. But uh, one of my favorite things to do is to listen to speeches from the presidents of the United States all the way back to the early part of this, the last century. And um, there's great things about all of our presidents. And I've learned from those things. And so, like, some people say they hated this president. Well, you know, I had that perception, too, until I listened to some of the things they had to say. And I started to get to know kind of like Donnie Marie, Don, Donnie Osmond. You know, you get you learn who he is and you actually meet him. He's a genuine guy. And I think, uh, you know, I really respect our presidents of the United States. I think there's good things. And we listen to media a lot and they turn people into monsters and talk about all the bad things. But uh, I like to find the good things in people and work off of those because we've got enough negative things going on. We don't need any more of that. We need to work on positive things. So there you go. What is your definition of success? My de definition of success is, uh, and this is gonna be a little bit different from an entrepreneur, business guy, CEO of a company, uh, is family. Uh, I, I de am determined that when I go home, the, and this is just how I am, I have the biggest smile on my face when I look through my window and I get to my front yard and I see my family in there. That is what gets me going. And I know I'm successful when my family loves me and I want to be there. That's success to me. I'm not driven by money. I know we need it. I know we need economy. And that builds uh, people's livelihood and jobs and so forth. And so I understand that. But that's my job. But success is uh, relationships with your family. That's where... That's where I define it. I'm, I'm going to go on a little tangent on this one and make it a little specific to him. What future destination would you most like to take your tour to? I think in the back of my mind right now, I want to end up in Peru. Yeah, I've been studying Peruvian Spanish and estoy aprendiendo todos los días español. That's, I'm learning this language and, and, and I'm listening to it. 
And so I have all these Peruvian phrases and, and lingo and so forth. So when I'm talking to people here in Las Vegas who speak Spanish, they're like, that's not how we say that. That's a swear word. I'm like, well, not Peru. It's not, not according to my iPod. Have you ever been down to Peru? No, never been down there. But that's one of the uh, Machu Picchu and those areas. I, my wife always has wanted to go down there. So I'm looking at uh, expanding our company down into Peru. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Wow, 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 wow. By the way, Peru, eat the chicken. Killer Peruvian chicken, Oyo. the best chicken in the world. And with that, we call it a day. The Vegas Legal Magazine Podcast. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Jared Fisher, owner of Escape Adventures. And Tyler Morgan, publisher of Vegas Legal Magazine. Jeff Haney, vice president of Fiero Communications, the friendliest PR company in town. Remember to like and share the Vegas Legal Magazine Podcast on Facebook. Also catch us on YouTube, iTunes, or my personal favorite, Stitcher. For all of you out there with a story, a story idea, an axe to grind, get a hold of Vegas Legal, the leading magazine in Southern Nevada legal market. You can call Tyler at 702-222-3476. Reach out, tell your friends, have a good one. We're out of here.